So on this feast of St. Peter Faber, like I said, it's one of the forgotten Jesuits. It's, he was blessed for the longest time, actually until recently. He was one of the first saints that were canonized by Pope Francis. And um, it was taking the exception. There's a, a process of canonization that we're becoming familiar with now in the Agrupacion with the, uh, with the cause of our founder, Father Felipe Rey de Castro, and also uh, Father Llorente. And we need to, in addition to provide writings, you know, an example of his spirituality, of what, uh, what uh, sets him apart, uh, memories of those who, rem who uh, were witness to them and to document those things. Well, in addition to the miracles that are asked as well uh, as, as, uh, as a sign of their divine intervention and, uh, and their uh, intercession, rather. Uh, one of the most basic things and the first thing we need and is kind of taken for granted is habeas corpus. Do you have a body? need to produce a body. There needs to be an actual proof that the person existed. That's the problem. We don't have St. Peter Faber's body. It's lost. Now, we know he existed. We have his writings. We have testimony. We have the miracles. The problem is the Society of Jesus was never able to produce or show evidence of where he is because he's lost underneath the Jesu Church in Rome. Underneath Jesu Church, there are catacombs as well, not the ancient catacombs, but there's a burial site before, actually before Napoleon invaded the city, um, it was common to bury people in the churches of Rome. And so underneath Jesu Church, you're, you can open one of the, it's very Indiana Jones, you can open one of the, uh, I, know, I know which one it is, you can lift up one of the stones, one of the, the pavements of the, uh, the church, there's stair, very narrow stairs, just about as wide as me. To go down, you need to have a lamp or a lantern. There's no light down there. And it's a winding catacombs that go down and down and down and down and all over the place. We know that St. Peter Faber, along with the other Jesuits who lived there throughout the centuries, are buried down there. And it was documented that when he died, they buried him underneath Jesu Church. The problem is that, well, it wasn't very fancy either. It was some brother that went in and painted the name of the person buried there. It was a whitewashed wall, a, a plaster wall, with just regular black paint, the date and the name, and that's it. And in one of the many catastrophic floods that happened in Rome, that underground chamber got full of water, and eventually all the names were erased from the wall. So we know that their bodies are, we just don't know who they are anymore because nobody ever wrote down exactly where they were. And so, if you go underneath there, yes, there are still catacombs. Some of them are around, the more recent ones you can still see, and then the rest are just blank. He's in one of them, we don't know which one. I volunteered, and uh, they have been opening some of them to see if they could identify which one's his. And um, again, that's a very Indiana Jones, because hmm, there are bones in there. When they're more than 100 years, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. It's just the more recent ones that I kind of let it respect, <laughs> let them stay there for a little bit longer. So I did go down into there, looking around, and well, again, we're talking about someone for uh, almost 500 years, a good chunk of 400 years ago. Um, they didn't have DNA evidence back then or anything. And so that's where archaeology jumps in. You try to find what else is there, perhaps uh, if there's any remnant of the uh, material that uh, he was uh, buried in. At that time, the uh, customs, the priest is buried in priestly garb as if you were ready for mass. So your first thing is you're gonna try to find if there's any remnants or any leftover material of priestly garb. And then, okay, now we've got a priest. And then you start trying to date the things and trying to figure out from what date they are. But nevertheless, because we have not been able to produce their actual body or remains of, uh, of St. Peter Favor, he got stuck in being blessed for it for almost for over 100 years. Um, the process just stopped. Uh, when Francis became Pope, one of the uh, first uh, things that he did was, well, he can waive any rule he wears, and he goes, well, we'll waive the whole uh, question of St. Peter Faber. We know he existed. The little technicality that we have, no relics, well, we'll just waive it, and he did. And he was one of the first uh, 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 blessings to be uh, 
uh, canonized by Pope Francis. I, I had the honor of being at that canonization at Jesu Church in Rome. And so St. Peter Faber in one way is forgotten in that way, that he stayed the eternal blessed and almost with no hope of ever becoming a saint. He's also the most known as the quiet one. St. Peter Faber was the first priest of the Society of Jesus. Before St. Ignatius was a priest, before St. Francis Xavier ever got ordained, St. Peter Faber was already the priest. He, he was the first one to be ordained of all of them. And he was also known as the most spiritual of them. In fact, St. Fran Ignatius had said, you know, he had learned, St. Peter Faber had learned the spiritual exercises so well that he thought, well, you can do them better than me. And he would often send people to St. Peter Faber to, uh, to uh, receive the uh, spiritual exercises from him. And so the, uh, the quiet, the, the, this quiet disciple, this quiet first companion, uh, did a lot of work in spirituality, which, well, he couldn't really write about what people were telling him. He couldn't write about the confessions he was hearing, but concentrated himself in Northern Italy, the French border, that's where he was from. He spoke also French and giving retreats, silent retreats, spiritual direction, all these things which he kept in his heart and keeps them still. St. Peter Favor becomes this, uh, the priest that uh, would celebrate mass for those first companions before they were ever ordained. And there's a couple of lithographs that show St. Ignatius going to mass and it's St. Peter Favor who's the one who's saying it. And that he would receive a lot of devotion by going to St. Peter Favor's mass. That's where we hear in today's gospel is almost ironic in that the uh, no one is above his teacher, no one is above his master. However, we seek to be as the master or like the teacher. And so St. Peter Faber certainly became so much like St. Ignatius to the point that Ignatius even said, no, this is my teacher. He has surpassed the master in a certain way. We continue our prayers for the Society of Jesus in this week, beginning with the Feast of St. Ignatius on Monday and uh, today as well and in a more special way in our province that is no longer the Antilles province. As of Monday, it is now the Caribbean province with uh, the same places as before, Miami, Cuba, Dominican Republic, but now with the addition of Guyana and Jamaica. And so we ask that intercession of the quiet apostle, of the quiet disciple of St. Peter Favor to ask for his blessings and for that continuous intercession for us here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>